fields are white and the workers are few, but the Lord of the harvest is faithful and true. He'll send forth more workers to accomplish his plan. Good morning and welcome to my father's place. We are going to be looking at a whole bunch of scripture today, but I will start out in Isaiah 30 so you can go there. What I'm going to speak today has the title, Prophesying What is Right. And I'll show you in various places what is right and what is not right and who says what and how the people respond. And so I'm going to pray first and then I'll get into it. Lord, you were very specific in what you said that I am to say. And so I know it is from you. There is just absolutely no doubt. And I know that if it was not from you, I would not even want to speak it. But since it is from you, I cannot help but speak it. So, Father, thank you for your son who made this connection possible. And Jesus, thank you for your spirit who teaches me all things. I pray, Lord, that this would go forth in the power of your spirit. And I pray it in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. So his power, his word, can't get any better than that. I feel very confident in what I'm going to say. So prophesying what is right. The Lord said to me, say what the false prophets say and say what the people say, and then say what I say. So when his servants say what he says, then they are prophesying what is right. I'm going to be using both the Old and the New Testaments, and a lot of people have been taught that the Old Testament is no longer useful to us. And so you would ask me, why am I using the Old and the New Testament? First, he told me to. <laughs> That's the most important thing. Then, as Paul says, both to the Corinthians, the believers at Corinth, and to Timothy, who he has placed in charge of the church at Ephesus. He says these things, 1 Corinthians 10, 11, about the Old Testament and the New. Now these things happen to them, that is the Jews in the wilderness, as an example. And they were written for our instruction, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. So he's speaking to non-Jewish believers in Jesus and telling them that the Old Testament is important and is written for our instruction. Then he tells Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. So that's why I'm using the old and the new and generally do, and specifically this time because he said so. My goodness. I will use the whole word of God to show you that many false prophets say the same things today that they said in the Old Testament. And many of God's people, many believers today, say the same things as they said in the Old Testament. And I will tell you the truth. The Lord says today the same thing that he said in the Old Testament in reply to them. So what is it to prophesy falsely? Jeremiah tells us in this passage, Lamentations 2.14, your prophets have seen for you false and foolish visions, and they have not exposed your iniquity, that is your sin, so as to restore you from captivity, but they have seen for you false and misleading oracles, literally seductive words that cause banishment. That's what that means. False and misleading oracles, seductive words that 
cause banishment. So I'm going to read this section from Isaiah 30, verses 9 through 11, and then I'm going to go over to verse 15. Verse 9 of Isaiah 30. For this is a rebellious people, false sons, sons who refuse to listen to the instruction of the Lord, who say to the seers, you must not see visions, and to the prophets, you must not prophesy to us what is right. Get out of the way, turn aside from the path. Let us hear no more about the Holy One of Israel. And therefore the Lord replies in this way in 15, For thus says the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, In repentance and rest you will be saved. In quietness and trust is your strength, but you were not willing. So in the Old Testament, false prophets said, to God's people, worship the false gods that all the countries around you are worshiping. But still outwardly worship the Lord in the temples and synagogues. That way, your sin will not be judged by the Lord. So God's people responded, we like what the false prophets are saying. We can please our lusts with the false gods. And thus worship the God of self, beloved. But still go to our synagogues and the temple. And God will be pleased because we outwardly worship him. Well, there will be no consequences for the sin that we're doing. Will there? But the Lord said in Jeremiah 18, 11, so now then, speak to the men of Judah and against the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I am fashioning calamity, misery, harm against you and devising a plan against you. Oh, turn back each of you from his evil way and reform your ways and deeds. The false prophet said, You do not need to repent. You are God's people. There is no need to turn back. He will never cause you to be miserable. He will not let anything bad happen to you. So God's people said to the Lord's prophets, who warned them to repent. Now I'll read a little from Isaiah 30 again, verses 10 and 11. You must not see visions. You must not prophesy to us what is right. Speak to us pleasant words. Prophesy illusions. Get out of the way. Turn aside from the path. Let us Hear no more about the Holy One of Israel. You must not prophesy to us what is right, they said. Now, do you understand what they are saying? They're saying, we know what is right. We know you are prophesying what is right, but we don't want to hear it. We would rather sin. That's what they're saying. They knew what was right. Otherwise, they wouldn't have said, stop prophesying it. It's the same today. And therefore, as I've already read, the Lord said in repentance, that is returning. And rest, that is setting your eyes on him alone. This is, this is the Hebrew to English. You will be saved in quietness in settling down with him as in a marriage. And trust in him alone is implied, is your strength, but you were not willing. That's his reply. I sent you someone who prophesied what is right. You said we don't want to hear it, even though we know what is right. And so you were not willing. The false prophet said, peace. Peace, you are at peace with your God. There is no need to be afraid. He will not judge your sin. So God's people said, we like the words of the false prophets. We like the message of peace, peace. We are at peace with God. That sounds good to us. There must be no consequences for the sin we are doing. But the Lord said in Jeremiah 6.14, they, that is the false prophets, have healed the brokenness of my people superficially, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. 
in Isaiah 57, 20. But the wicked are like a tossing sea, for it cannot be quiet, and its waters toss up refuse and mud. Verse 21, there is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. They say, peace, peace, when there is no peace. So the Lord did not just warn his people once, but again and again from Jeremiah 29, 18 and 19. I will pursue them with the sword, with famine and with pestilence, and I will make them a terror to all the kingdoms of the earth to be a curse and a horror and a hissing and a reproach among all the nations where I have driven them because, verse 19, They have not listened to my words, declares the Lord, which I sent to them again and again by my servants, the prophets. But you did not listen, declares the Lord. The false prophets said, the Lord will continue to protect you because you are his people. The Lord will not destroy Jerusalem, as his prophets are saying. After all, this is the temple of the Lord. It's right here, right here in Jerusalem. The Lord would never have anyone attack that. So God's people said, that sounds good to our ears. And the false prophets have even said it three times like this. It's the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. They were impressed. So they said, we're protected from our enemies because God is here in his temple. It's right here. There must be no consequence for the sin we are doing. But the Lord said in Jeremiah 7, 4, do not trust in deceptive, that is lying words, saying, this is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. The false prophet said, we will continue with our false words that are from our own imagination That's from Jeremiah 23, 16. We will continue with our false words that are from our own imagination. If you flee to Egypt to escape the Babylonians who are about to overtake Jerusalem, you will be safe. The Lord will protect you there, for you are his people. So the Lord's people responded, we like what you are saying. The Lord will protect us when we flee to Egypt, for we are his people. There must be no consequences for the sin we are doing. So God's people said to Jeremiah when he had prophesied what is right, that they should not go to Egypt. They said this, Jeremiah 43, 2, you are telling a lie. The Lord our God has not sent you to say you are not to enter Egypt to reside there. But Baruch, the son of Neriah, is inciting you against us to give us over into the hand of the Chaldeans, Babylonians. So they will put us to death or exile us in Babylon. But the Lord said in Jeremiah 42.10, If you will indeed stay in this land, then I will build you up and not tear you down, and I will plant you and not uproot you, for I will relent concerning the calamity that I have inflicted on you. Verse 13 of Jeremiah 42, But if you are going to say we will not stay in this land, we will not listen to the voice of the Lord your God, saying, No, but we will go to the land of Egypt where we will not see war or hear the sound of a trumpet or hunger for bread, and we will stay there. Verse 16 of Jeremiah 42, if you say that, then the sword which you are afraid of will overtake you there in the land of Egypt, and the famine about which you are anxious will follow closely after you in Egypt, and you will die there. Do you see the difference? Prophesying what is right does not provide a life of luxury and wealth and comfort. For 40 years, Jeremiah, the prophet of the Lord, prophesied what was right. During those years, the false prophets and the Jewish leaders and other officials of Jerusalem, 
beat him, imprisoned him, put him in stocks, and threw him down a cistern. That is a well that had no water in it anymore, just kind of like a hole in the ground. And it was all muddy at the bottom, so it was like quicksand that he would sink into and die. And that's from Jeremiah 22, 20 verse 2, Jeremiah 38 verse 6, and many other passages. So he didn't have a very good time of it. People didn't welcome him with open arms. They didn't come in droves to hear the next thing he was going to say. And after 62 years of prophesying what is right, Isaiah was brutally sawn into pieces, one piece at a time until he died. They thought they had silenced him, but the words the Lord gave him lived on. Now, after Babylon had exiled many of God's people, the Lord told Jeremiah to make a wooden yoke for his neck representing the Babylonian captivity. He instructed Jeremiah to wear it as he prophesied what is right. But the false prophet, Hananiah, said in Jeremiah 28, 2 and 3, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, I have broken the yoke of the king of Babylon. Within two years I am going to bring back to this place all the vessels of the Lord's house, which Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, took away from this place and carried to Babylon and all the people. They're all going to be back in two years. So God's people said, Hananiah's words sound good to us. Everyone who has already been carried into exile in Babylon will be returning in just two years, even our king. And Hananiah says, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel. We are impressed. He says, he speaks just like the Lord's prophet. Thus says the Lord. So there must be no consequences for the sin we are doing. But the Lord had already said through Jeremiah, from Jeremiah 25, 11 and 29, 10, this whole land will be a desolation and a horror. And these nations will serve the king of Babylon 70 years, including you, Judah. Jeremiah 29, 10, for thus says the Lord when 70 years have been completed for Babylon, that is for your Babylonian exile that you are all going into, I will visit you and fulfill my good word to you to bring you back to this place. Two years, says the false prophet, 70, says the Lord. Do you see? They will say what sounds good to your ears. And it will lull you into thinking that there are no consequences for the sin that you are doing, beloved. How do I know you're sinning? (laughs) I know I was sinning when I was a believer, but not filled with the Spirit. It wasn't until I was filled with the Spirit that he killed my sin nature in me so Since sin was no longer in me, I no longer sinned and purified my heart. So I worshiped the Lord and him only then, then, then. Then he had accomplished what he wants to accomplish in every Christian today. Before that, I sinned. Then sin was no longer in me. So I did not sin any longer. But. Today's prophet. Say to sinning believers, God is not angry with you. You cannot help but sin. You do not need to repent and confess your sin to the Lord. All of your sins, past, present, and future, has already been forgiven. And then they say, when God looks at you, he sees you as holy and righteous, regardless of your sin. So you are not bound by Jesus Christ teaching. You are not responsible for your sin. And we have even more good news for you. 
God wants to make you rich and successful. So today's sinning believers say, we like what these false prophets say. Why look at the vast number of followers they have. We're impressed. Some of them even appear to be quoting the Bible and use just a few words from it to prove what they want you to believe. Their words please our lusts to have everything we can possibly get right now. So we do not need to repent. They say so. Because we're forgiven for everything we might ever do for sin. There must be no consequences then for the sin we are doing. But Jesus Christ, God the Son, says from Matthew 7, 21 through 23, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. I never, ever knew you. It's the ultimate negative in the original Greek. Never, ever, never. I never knew you. Depart from me, you who sin. And Jesus Christ exhorts all believers then and now regarding their sin and the consequences of it from Matthew 9, 43 through 48. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than having your two hands to go into hell, into the unquenchable fire, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Verse 45, if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life lame than having your two feet to be cast into hell where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. If your eye causes you to stumble, that is sin. Throw it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Remember what the Lord said to his rebellious people. I read it to you before. Isaiah 30, 15. In repentance, that is returning to me. And rest, setting your eyes on him alone. You will be saved in quietness, that is settling down with him. And trust in him alone is your strength, but you are not willing. Beloved, are you willing to repent from your sin and return to the Lord? He wants to know that today. Are you willing to set your eyes on him and him alone? Are you willing to settle down with him like in a marriage, spiritually? Are you willing to trust in him and him alone? You will be saved if you do these things. You will not be saved if you do not do them. In repentance and rest, you will be saved. In quietness and trust is your strength. You will have no strength if you do not settle down with him as in a marriage. So repent. Confess your sin to him. Throw away the teaching of the false prophets who say things completely contrary, as you have seen, to the word of God. Ask your Father in heaven to fill you with his Holy Spirit. It isn't hopeless, beloved. This is your great hope, Christ in you.
So ask your Father in heaven to fill you with his Holy Spirit so your sin nature is crucified, dead and buried, hallelujah, never to rise again. And your heart is purified and you become a partaker of his divine nature, the sin nature no longer being in you, but dead. God's divine nature in you. Peter speaks of it in 2 Peter 1, 4, for by these great promises, he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. He'll free you from lust. So, beloved, who will you believe? Will you believe the Lord? Or will you believe the ones who speak pleasant things to you? Will you cast his words to the side? Or will you heed them? That is the question that you must answer. And now is a very good time to do it. Because today is the day of salvation. Seek the Lord while he is near. Call on him while he is near. While he may be found, seek him. It's a limited time offer. Lord Jesus, I have done as you commanded. May hearts be pricked. May there be repentance. Oh, you will be glorified by it, if they will do it. And you will set them free, just as you promised, from slavery to sin. Let it be so, I pray, in your name. Amen. The fields are white and the workers are few, but the Lord of the harvest is faithful and true. He'll send forth more workers to accomplish his plan and pour out his spirit.